This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby, baby. I want to ride, ride, ride. Do you know the way? Today's guest, Andrew Calderella, does. His journey has been built on many challenges from dyslexia, learning disabilities, blindness, and even being bullied. Andrew had to work hard to carve himself a place in this world, and he shares the wisdom and life's mission in his book, The Way. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Lucy. Thank you for having me on your show. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So you had quite the um, set of challenges growing up. Um, I'm familiar with dyslexia and learning disabilities. Uh, Our youngest son has it. He's now 19. Um, So I've seen his journey and his struggles in a world where there's a lot of assistive technology. Add to that for you, you had the challenge of being blind in one eye and then also growing up in a time that wasn't very adaptive to your needs. How did that shape your story? Sure. Uh, That's a a really good question. Obviously, it created a lot of challenges. This whole idea of the roller coaster on your show, that's what kind of drew me here, is that my whole life has been like that. You know, as as I have these learning disabilities, and like you rightly said, I was born legally blind in one eye. I have have a lazy eye, so they put a patch over my good eye to actually make me look out of that bad eye to strengthen it. So you can imagine not being able to see hardly anything uh, and my disabilities, I was bullied a lot, um, not only by students, but teachers too. I you know, teacher mocked me in front of the whole class telling me I was too stupid to learn and I should just drop out. And, you know, being called stupid and li- or mocked and laughed at and everything your, your beginning years creates a lot of challenges. I was also uh, born with some gifts too. So a lot of times you'll see in my book, I outline a lot of people's names Some of our greatest leaders throughout time have had uh, one form or another of a learning disability. And my mother was somebody who helped save me and I had a good teacher. Once for them, I I really don't know that I would have made it um, because they believed in me and kept showing me that I could do things and I could do things that other kids couldn't do. And uh, as I grew, I learned I was a genius in abstract thinking and all sorts of other things. So I was able to compensate and learn how to overcome some of these problems. Um, I did graduate from elementary school and high school. I was a school leader. I was an athlete. I went on to college, got three degrees, lived overseas, did a whole bunch of stuff, started companies, wrote a book, <laughs> and then dyslexic out there that saying you wrote a book, you must not have dyslexia. I did. It took me 30 years deciphering code and everything else. So it was really, really hard. Um, so as far as like my, my beginning journey and, and all of these struggles, I think the the whole effect of it was to help me persevere and not give up and to know that my worth in myself is not determined on what other people think of me or what even they're judging me that I can do. We never know how far somebody can go in life unless you give them the best chance that they can have. To write a kid off uh, is ridiculous. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, So I could go on. It is, it is. And um, you would think that teachers would know better. My son still faced that from a couple of teachers and uh, being ridiculed because they didn't understand the extent of his problem. He's even had teachers uh, in high school that claimed that he was making it up. So the, the struggle is there. And because I find because it's an invisible disability, people tend to disregard it. And your point to there are some extraordinary people out there that have learning challenges and things like dyslexia. Richard Branson has always been um, somebody that I've quoted to my son simply because of everything that he's accomplished. And the mind of somebody with dyslexia is somewhat genius because it does find its way around and creates different opportunities and gifts that, that we don't, that the rest of us don't have because our, our brains are somewhat lazy. It does 
what it's supposed to do, how it's supposed to do it. Well, I, you know, I, what I look at it is, as you study all of human history and the diversity of humanity, these learning differences, people have labeled them back in the day as dis disabilities. It's really just a different way of learning. Just because I might not be able to do math super fast or spell or whatever it may be, doesn't mean I'm not an intelligent person, right? It just means that those skills I had to give up to gain my ability to take mass data and see, uh, you know, st strings in it or whatever theories and things that other people couldn't see. And, you know, it's, it's one of these uh, things in humanity where we sometimes see a difference, some of us, as something that's wrong. You know, it's new and it's scary versus it's new and it's interesting. I believe that if we could harness, find these traits in these kids when they're young and realize that they probably do have some latent or uh, some ability that we can nurture. And so many of us drop out of school and you see these people's stories. I mean, I dropped out of high school and, you know, and whatever and went on to start these companies and do all, does all these things. If we were able to help them harness their gifts and show them how they could uh, excel at that and, and then compensate for the other thing. My problem in the 60s and 70s was everybody was hammering like, you gotta learn how to spell, you gotta learn. No, really what I need to learn is how to look up words in the dictionary. And for God's sake, it'd be nice if we had an English language that made sense that you know sounded, words sounded like they were spelled and that they didn't have all these weird obtuse rules that make no sense at all. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? For every 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 time you think you learn something, it's like, nope. There's three ways to spell that same sounding word. It's like, oh, okay, why? I don't know. But <laughs> I I think that's a struggle. Given what I see on social media, I think that's a struggle that everybody has when it comes to the English language. Yeah. Now you mentioned that it took you 30 years to write the book. How did the theme of the book weave itself through your journey? Okay, well, when I started this, uh, I had a lot of spiritual experiences in my life, and one really big one, I was like 19, 20, and um, after that, I discovered the 10 laws, and I was on this path to find some of these other answers. So 30 years of this journey was deep research. I'm talking studying everything you can imagine. It's kind of like when, when God shows you something, it's, it's so detailed, it's like you may not understand everything. It takes a long time to learn and figure out what the meanings was. So I had to dissect everything from the, how the universe was made, how our bodies work, minds, everything. And along this journey, I found some unbelievable epiphanies that just were so unbelievable that we don't all know this. And it's not just common knowledge and part of our society um, that I was compelled to write in the book. So I started this journey. I have these four pillars, self, society, universe, and God. And I was working on this for, like I said, 30 years. And on 2015, on April uh, 3rd, I was sorting out the beginning and ending of this grander work. And I kept saying, this is key to true success. This is key to true success. And I put these seven keys together in the right order. And it was like a secret code got unlocked. And I worked for three days straight, kind of organizing the book, figuring out where all these answers fit in. And then the next five years to um, get the, the first book out. Uh, I wrote all three at the same time. It was one massive book, but we're breaking up into three. Um, so this journey has been a 30 year journey and it's just been uh, one struggle after another. And anybody that has, doesn't understand dyslexia. When I write, it's like every sentence is, you know, most of the words are misspelled. Uh, the words are in the wrong order. If you don't read the sentence and try to dissect it right away, you may or may not ever be able to because it's sometimes so crazy. And then every, the paragraphs are backwards, the sentences, you know, everything. So it took a long time just to get it to make sense. And people are saying, oh, I love your style, I love your style. You know, can you write in this style, that's style. I just try to make this thing make sense. If my style is like, can I get, make these paragraphs in order and all the sentences make sense and explain what I'm trying to explain. And that is, I guess, my style. Um, so it's, it's just been a, a great challenge. But like I said, the only reason I'm doing this is because this knowledge is not common and these universal truths are human universal truths. These are how we as humanity become our best selves and create a better society. And you've compared this book to uh, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, sort of a, a revised version of it. How, yeah. how do you find it similar or how, how do you find it different from Think and Grow Rich? Sure, well, just to give you a quick uh, story, Napoleon Hill, 30 years working on that book. Uh, I think it was Carnegie hired him or told him to go out and talk to all the greatest uh, 
industrialist leaders of the world at that time and, and figure out what they felt like made them successful, right? And if you read the book, it's really uh, virtue after virtue after virtue. These are ideas of what the super rich think made them make a lot of money. Now, the, the, the way, 30 years with the research on how, not how you can just become super rich, but how you can become the best person you can be, live this meaningful life as well as help create a better world. And what I've found, and just at the heart of the way, the human way for us to succeed in life is to live rational, positive action. And that's what the way is. It's about doing something all the time. Obviously, the solution's got to be something you live. It's got to be logical and rational. It's got to be customizable to fit in everybody's life. It's, got, it's about being good. You know, living rational, positive is about goodness. And when I talked about virtue, all of human... Um, I want to say all the traits that humans find the most valuable, we call virtues. And this is being honest and dedicated, going the extra mile, being happy and hopeful, everything else that you can imagine that you would want to be are virtues. So it's about integrating these virtues into your life. But to do that, you usually need the best practices. For example, like a virtue of being punctual requires best practices of leaving on time, setting reminders and whatnot. Every virtue has a set of best practices. So the way is about integrating all virtue and best practice into your life, not just the 10 or 20, 30, whatever that Napoleon Hill found that were important. And I, and this is really key. You cannot just embrace one virtue without other virtues. It's like the, the idea of law and order without the idea of justice and treating people as you want to be treated and equality, uh, just law and order becomes a dictatorship or communism or something. You know what I mean? So it's about, all of us kind of embracing these core values and working from the center out instead of all this fringe issue that we're having, all this division and whatnot people are telling us. We're really not divided. This is all just a big game that's being played on us. Yeah, and I think that, you know, when it comes to whether or not we're divided, I think that just comes down to we're speaking different languages. We're probably all saying the same thing but it's just the words and how we're saying it is, is coming together differently for different people. Because I think fundamentally, we all want to be good people. We all want to be successful. We all want to love and be loved and have good relationships. And when it comes to Napoleon Hill's book, it was, it was written in 1930 or in the 30s. So it is a little bit challenging in the sense that, you know, it's sort of a, a very formal English. And even some of the stories, the way he phrases things, it, it's not, you know, it's not written in modern day in even how he makes references to certain groups of people. So it's really, it, it's inspiring to see that somebody else is taking it to the the next level so that it's, more applicable to who we are today. Now you mentioned, you know, the virtues and you have to have the practices to go along with the virtues, but everybody has to start somewhere. If somebody is looking at creating meaningful, meaningful change in their life, they may have some bad habits. They may not know what their beliefs are. They may not have all of these things in place. So what would be the call it the first baby step that they could take to say, pick a virtue and start creating the habits around it that can then be the foundation for everything else. Right. You know, on my journey, what I have found is that any, any foundation of your life that is out of order, it's like we are as strong as our weakest link. You ever seen those guys where they're balancing those plates on sticks and they're running around, keeping them all balanced. That's what your life is like. If any one of these plates fall, it'll seriously ruin you. And it doesn't matter your relationship with your kid, your wife, your, uh, your work is destroyed. Your finances are destroyed. You can just go list, you know, this big list. So what I found is that you can't just start on one thing. It's like, great, I'm super healthy, but I have horrible relationships. Are you happy? No. You know, so we need to kind of balance out your entire life. And what I did, and, and this is one of the most frustrating things that I ever found is that a lot of people write books to write books. They write books because they want you to buy the next one, the next one, and the next one, and the 50 after that. And I kind of got tired of that. Honestly, if you go to the store and you look at any of the success books, all of them out there, you can just look at them and, and find the virtue and then see if they actually have a practice on how you actually integrate it. A lot of books are just like, be healthy. 
You know what I mean? It's like, great, thanks for that. Uh, that's really a virtue, yes, but um, how do you do it? So that's where the, the way comes in. If you want to start somewhere and get on your true path to your true self, to your true life, help create a better world, you need to integrate a wide variety of vital information into your life as quickly as possible. So what I did is I put it all in one book. You don't have to read about how I dissected Freud and Jung and Skinner and all these things and whatever. You just get the, the bottom line. You know, what is the true goal of life? How do you uh, succeed at the true goal of life? What are the seven steps on how you actually do this for everybody? And again, this isn't Andrew's way. This is human way. What I put in this book is the way that we as humans collectively have found to do these things. So when I'm talking about like uh, all of faith, okay, all of faith, all success, all society is about basically three, three things, right? It's about you becoming your better self creating a better world and your connection with the divine. That is it. Okay. And if we could just get down to the fundamentals of how we actually achieve that, forget all the fringe issues. I can tell you right now, all the diets out there that you see are all about scams are all about you not eating this and only eating meat, only eating this. This is about people making money. It's not about how your body works, right? You need to know the basics on how to keep your body, your emotions, your, your mind, um, your, your spirituality, all kind of working for you. You need to know how to have better relationships, you know, how to make a better friend, uh, the core value systems that can save the world, all the rest of these, how, how society actually works, the basic systems and everything else. And that's where I'm saying like in the way, if you look at it, it's just more information after information on how you can actually get this. I want you to get everybody on the same page so then we can actually live it. I don't want you to read it, spending 50 years reading books. And, and I do find that certain books, they dangle a carrot that it's going to have that magical secret in it. And then you get to the end and you're thinking, did I miss something? Exactly. You know, the like, secret is a good example of that, right? I, and the secret and, you know, with all, due, resp with all due, yes. due respect to the secret, I mean, it has made an incredible amount of money. But, but I think, scam, you know how, right? you know, you know how books have a title and then they have the su subtitle. Yeah. I kind of think that the secret subtitle should be the secret and then in parentheses and lies. Yeah. Because well, let me just say this. Uh, the, the secret is about two things, right? It's just about how to make a proper affirmation and how to be open to abundance. That is it. And they're saying that that's the secret to life. That is not it. <laughs> you, know, you clearly need a lot more than that. No. And in fact, you know, it was... I watched The Secret and I'm grateful for The Secret because it started me on a path of exploring those thought leaders that were featured in it. And, you know, I sort of coached myself. I built my own practice. I, you know, I went on a similar journey that you did. But I say that it's secret and lies because there's when you start to read Think and Grow Rich, which it's based on, then you realize there's all these components that they left out. It did not give a complete picture. It was a great piece of cinematography. It was well it was put marketing. together. Yeah, I think it was just a market. It was a way people to make money. I, I've talked to some of the people behind the scenes on that, and they knew it wasn't the end all, but they knew because of the people they had and the way they could market it, they could make a lot of money. And you see that today. Um, you know, I'm trying to build this business and this uh, movement and everything else around these principles to actually make positive change. Certainly there will be money that will come, but it will be to, to facilitate this change. Um, I think there's really two different types of leaders in the world, honestly. There, there are leaders really looking to help us and uh, find solutions for everybody. And then we get these other leaders who are looking to control and, you know, put their finger, their thumb over everybody. And it's everything's a competition, win, lose. And I think some people get caught up in this whole idea that money and wealth and fame are the goal of life, you know, and that's obviously, that's been throughout time. And it's always been, everybody that knows is spirituality and the goodness, it's not about uh, that. It's about you becoming the best person you can be and living your best life and having all those components of what that actually means. So. And the concept of living your best life is different from every, from anybody else and i think that's where we get the competition coming into play is because i know but we all assume we all assume <clears throat> that we want the same thing so we're competing against who well no well here's the deal you're only competing with yourself in this life everybody else in the life that that is around you is either going to be trying to help you or hurt you right you can see it like that and if we can create a better society 
uh, we can all grow up and have a better life, then we're not going to be competing against each other. We're competing to help each other. It's like a race. I don't know if you've been an athlete, but you don't no. want to go to a race where people are, are beating you up or trying to trip you and, you know, poison you before the night. You know, this is not true competition. True competition is we have rules. You go there and you, the athletes are giving it their all. And it's all about these, uh, this rule. It's, a, it's the similarities that we share are more um, than our differences. And let me just say this to you. I know we don't, we're kind of running out of time a little bit, but the, the whole game of life, you ever seen the, the child's game of life? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've played okay. it. Okay, so the real game of life that we're playing right now is similar. You open up this board, you have a game pieces, you move along it. The, the rules and regulations are the human conditions. Okay, the human conditions are universals like day and night, gravity, space, time, entropy, and all these big things. And then the human centric ones, which are that we're born ignorant, takes so long for us to develop. We need fuels, we need air, all these different pieces. You put all those together and it really points us at focusing us on three things, which is self-development, self-control, and societal development. And with those three focuses, you really see the meaning of life. The meaning of life is to make your life meaningful. To make your life meaningful, again, we're all born ignorant and helpless, so we need a society and our parents and caregivers to give us a really good start if we're actually going to reach our full potential. So to do that, we knowing that our society is messed up, all need to get on the same page regarding some of these foundations of life and then join together in the right way to make these changes happen. And that's where the way comes in, uh, the one movement and party so that we can actually get on the same page and make all these uh, changes happen. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, and what's meaningful, what, what makes my life meaningful might be different than what makes your life meaningful. We have different desires, we have different purposes that we're living out. As long as we're all, you know, we're all intentional and we're living for the greater good. Well, it's, it's like, let me say it to you this way. Your primary purpose in life is for you to become your best self, live your best life and go to heaven. The primary purpose of society is to create our true society. It doesn't matter what other purposes you have. You being the best person you can be is going to make everything else you do better right? You're not going to be raising your kids well if your, uh, you know, mind is really confused, you're really unhealthy, you're really, really tired all the time. You know what I mean? If all these things are going to slow you down and hurt you. So the better you are, the better you can do with your life. And that's why I'm talking about primary uh, centering yourself in these ideals. While we're all very different, we're all human beings. We're all the same on certain levels. And you're right that the whole beauty of life is that we're not the same. It's the diversity within our commonality that makes humanity wonderful. It would be horrible if everybody was the same. I mean, who would want to live in a world where everywhere you go, it's exactly the same and everybody's the same. The beauty and the, the wonder of humanity is that we're so different, yet we share so much. And what I'm saying is that Let's not get caught up in the differences and the fringes and all this. Let's get focused on the center first. And if we all adhere, to, let me just say it to you this way. Those two principles are the first two laws within uh, step four center. The next three are respect life, treat other people as you would want to be treated, and all people are equal. Just the idea of all people are equal and treating others as you would want to be treated will solve most of the problems within our society. The George Floyd and all these other uh, horrible situations we have could not happen if you see people as equal and are you... And you are treating them as you want to be treated. You know what I'm saying? It's like if that is integrated into everybody's life and you ask your child this all the time when they do things wrong, is that what you would want to be treated like? Are you treating them like you would want to be treated? You bring this into their mind so it's always in their thought process. We can fix this world. Just the idea of respecting life. This world is our you know, our womb, it, it provides our food, our water, our shelter, everything we can possibly need in life is provided by the natural capital of this world. It makes absolute 100% chance or sense to uh, maintain it correctly, to help it. I mean, we don't even need to do much. Life will grow if, by, if we just leave it alone. You know what I mean? We just need to like give it the opportunity to do what it needs to do to care for us. And it will. We just have a few destructive uh, practices and leaders that are uh, doing this to us and it's born out of these legacy systems and you know the human race kind of evolving over time but I believe right now I know we're running out of time that this is the time in human history the only time that this could ever happen we're more connected more awake than we ever have been in all of human history we can literally make changes in this world in the whole world within weeks and days I mean we can have a movement that will, could span the entire world right now because of the connectivity we have 
a, a billion people with giving a dollar a month could literally change the world for the good. And I think in some context, we've proven that if we all come together, we can create the massive change, regardless of where you fall on the spectrum of the COVID vaccine. Still, in a very short period of time, the world came together, they had a problem, and there was a, they came up with a solution. That's Absolutely. proof that if we are focused on the greater good on one thing, then we can come up with these solutions. But the problem is, is outside of, you know, the world of COVID, we're then thrown back into this world of competition. Well, it's a false competition. Honestly, yes. if anything is proven, it's that all of us are dependent on another. No one is an island, okay? If uh, Brazil cuts down the rainforest, uh, we're gonna die. If uh, China builds endless coal plants, we're gonna die. If You know what I mean? It's like no one nation has, has a hold on it or not. You know what I mean? It's like we're all interdependent. So let's get over this whole idea that we're competing against each other. Do you really, really, really want the Chinese state to fail? You know what that would mean? I mean, or Russia, you know what I'm saying? We want them to evolve, to become better countries, better places to live, you know, embracing uh, the higher ideals of virtue and goodness and all of these kind of things. That's what we really want. And that's what we need to do. This idea of war as any type of solution is only thought of by a few leaders at the very, very top who will never have to go. There is not one book I have ever read by any soldier that's been in World War I, World War II, or any conflict that is like, yeah, war is wonderful. I love seeing my friends blown up and being maimed and, uh, and, and having this PTSD when I come back from war. And No, <laughs> it's like that's the last option. And if I've studied all of human history, and it seems like it's always a failure of a few men over and over and over and over again that... You know, we get pushed and pushed and pushed to a point where we're either going to throw down in a revolution or these few people are going to go to war. This cycle has got to stop. And that's why I've done some videos on all of this stuff. I have videos on why violence will never lead to lasting peace, how to peacefully force positive change. I just released a video uh, just today, actually, on why we're not divided, what the real problems are and how we can fix everything. These solutions are out there and they always have been. They've just been a little fragmented and scattered but now we can put them all together in one place and get this done. There are leaders in this world that want us divided because they gain more power, wealth, and fame. They have been corrupted by, the, by those um, temptations and they are leading us away. They are dividing us, right? They're deceiving us. So we all want the truth. We all want a better society. Nobody wants pollution. Nobody wants their kids to grow up and, uh, in a horrible world. You know what I'm saying? It's, this is universal. What I'm saying is let's, let's center around the universals and we can deal with the fringe issues after we get some, kind of these base things figured out because that's where we're missing it. You know what I'm saying? We're always dealing with all these fringe issues and saying, oh, look at our differences. Look at our differences. The problem is we're not focusing on, look at our similarities, look at our similarities. We need to figure out the water system, the food systems, the energy systems, all these basics all over the world, and then create a societies where everybody can gain and become the best people that they can be. Is that where you built the foundation to sort of lead the charge on all of this? Absolutely. So the seventh foundation, uh, every movement that you have, every even a book that's going to last beyond you needs some type of organization. So the seventh foundation is not only to support the book, the movement, and uh, it has a lot of other plans down the road once I get to them. But yes, so the seventh foundation is to be kind of the holding house or whatever, the legal entity that kind of helps us do all of these different things. And again, I just want people to know this isn't about me, okay? Honestly, a dyslexic half blind kid is not the kid you would pick to write a book and, and um, do all this stuff. So I'm doing this because nobody else is doing it. It needs to be done. I've had these experience. I found this knowledge, so I'm trying to share it with everybody. Um, it's only going to work is if all of us kind of kind of get on the same page and understand these basic concepts. I have not had one person look at my book or anything I'm doing right now and really give me negative feedback. It's all been really positive, which I'm really grateful for. But I think that's I say that because these are universal truth. These are pieces of the puzzle that we're all seeking. All of us have some. What I found is those three or five or 10 or 50 or whatever may be that you're missing 
that will destroy you. Ignorance is bliss until you know, you're dead, right? Until you're, you have that disease because you didn't know you were breathing in asbestos or whatever it means. So this idea of, of us, uh, like how do you fix society? How do you, how do you create a better world? You need to create better people. How do you create better people? We all need to have kind of basic insights on how things work, how our bodies work, how our minds work, how friendships work, how relationships work, how society works. You know what I'm saying? All these basic uh, concepts. And you should not have to wait until you're in your 40s and 50s after reading 50 books to figure this stuff out. This should be kind of common knowledge. You should be raising your kids this way. Just imagine raising your kid with all the best practices on how to eat and sleep and deal with their mind and their friendships and all the rest of the pieces, they don't have to relearn anything later. Now they're that much further ahead, right? They're 15, 18, 19, 20, 50, and they're still uh, embracing these, these core beliefs and these habits that are breaking them through. So they're gonna go a lot further in life than some of us who have to now at 35, wow, I just learned how to consume water properly or how to, how to talk to my wife, <laughs> you know? Oh, I just learned after my second kid, actually, the, some of the keys to raising kids. What? Wouldn't it be nice to know that stuff when you were in high school? <laughs> you know? And so like much, get out. So, yeah, so much of this is, you know, I've been saying for, for years that our educational system is inherently broken and that so many of these things do need to be taught in school. They're far more important than, you know, can you do calculus? You know, the, it, well, it comes out of this legacy systems, right? We're yes. dealing with the school system hasn't changed since the 1800s. No, I mean, really, they're, seriously. <laughs> yeah, they're they're breeding people to punch clocks. Now you're and you're leading this. You're taking the charge on this really important movement to really create a massive shift for humanity. How can people connect with you? Sure. The best place is my website. Uh, that's seven way me. That's the number seven W A Y dot M E. You can find me. My name again is Andrew Calderella. It's like Cinderella, except I'm the male version. So it's Calderella. <laughs> um, and yes, I am looking for my princess to rescue me out there. Um, so when you search for me, you can search for the way, look for seven revolutionary steps, just because the way is a little too general. There's a lot of way out there. So it's the book is available everywhere. It's not out on audio yet, but it will be. Uh, the second and third book are coming out soon. They're both in editing. Um, and again, seven way me. So it's a number seven W A Y dot M E. And again, you can find videos up there. You can, uh, get all sorts of materials to help you in your life. You can learn about the way, uh, and, you know, find all sorts of shows I've been on all sorts of great materials there. You can sign up and learn more. Well, if you're looking at connecting with Andrew, check out the show notes. I am going to have all of his links in there. And thank you so much for joining me today, Andrew, and sharing your story. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at the Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by the Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creator. Life is like a roller coaster, baby.